coming up on Garden Talk. I myself have never had increased yield from topping in auto. And these days I'm really trying to focus more on feeding the soil rather than feeding the plant. A lot of this stuff is just kind of subjective as, to, again, what you're doing, what your goals are, what your grow area looks like. They're great for concentrates as well. A lot of people are actually growing them because of the fact that they grow so fast. They're able to turn them around and press them and create concentrates right from the flowers. If you're in a really small area and you've got a ceiling max height, then you might consider smaller pots. You definitely, in my opinion, want to transplant them well before the stretch. Everything that's alive has a will to survive. You know, even microbial life, everything wants to live. What's up, everybody? If you that don't know me, my name is Chris, a.k.a. Mr. Grow It, and you're tuned into the Garden Talk podcast. This is episode number 49. In this episode, I interview Tourette Grower. He has been gardening for five years and specializes in growing auto flower plants. In this episode, he talks about growing autos. Everything from starting soil, feedings, environment conditions, when to harvest, and more. Thanks to all of you who support this podcast or Patreon. If you'd like to support, you can do so by going to patreon.com slash mrgrowit. Before we get into it, I want to acknowledge that one of my goals for this podcast is to bring zero cost for information about gardening, all plants, to the general public. That being said, I'd like to thank the sponsors of today's podcast who helped make that goal possible. Thanks to Mars Hydro for sponsoring this video. Mars Hydro has two new LED grow lights, the FC8000 and the FCE8000. Both grow lights are 800 watts and will work great in a 4x4 or 5x5 grow space. The FC8000 has two versions, one with Samsung LM301B diodes and one with Samsung LM301H diodes. Also, the bars are detachable. Both the FC and FCE8000 are very suitable for CO2 growers. A link to the website is down in the description section below, and you can use coupon code MrGrowIt for a discount on their products. Big shout out to AC Infinity for sponsoring this podcast. AC Infinity is well known to produce high quality products and provide excellent customer service. They have the thickest grow tent on the market today, inline vans with a controller that can automatically turn on and off according to specific set points. They have seedling mats, trimmers, drying racks, and several other products that you can use in your garden. I will leave a link to AC Infinity down in the description section below, and you can use discount code MrGrowIt during checkout for a discount on their products. A big supporter of this podcast is Dutch Pro. They sponsor this podcast, and I use their nutrients. I have been using their base nutrients formulated specifically for RO and soft water. I also have been using some of their additives like CalMag, Silica, and their root stimulator called Take Root. They have a few other additives on top of those and pH regulators. Coupon code MrGrowIt10DP will get you a discount on their products. And I'll leave a link to their Amazon store down in the description section below. All right, we're back. Welcome to the Garden Talk podcast. Today I am joined with Chad, but some of you know him as Tourette Grower. How are you doing today? Hey man, I'm doing very well. How are you doing? Doing good. Good. Thanks for asking. Uh, excited to have you on. Finally have you on my podcast. I had you on my live show. I was on your podcast. So now we got you here on my Garden Talk podcast. We're going to be talking all about autos today. So becoming more and more popular autos. I mean, it's just about every day where somebody hits me up and has a question about autos and you have a whole podcast based around them. So I thought you'd be a great person to have on and talk about autos, kind of your experience with them and, and so on and so forth. So we're going to get into so much stuff in regards to autos today. But first, one of the things I like to do with every guest would be an introduction. So can you tell us a little bit about yourself and kind of how you got into gardening? Yeah, man. First, I just want to say thank you for having me on. I'm uh, really honored and I appreciate it. Um, I got really passionate about gardening probably about five years ago. Uh, before that, mm, I'd been around like my grandparents who gardened a lot, um, vegetable gardens, a lot of irises and, and just different plants and trees around their property. Um, kind of grew up a little around that and that's kind of my exposure to it. And uh, But I wasn't really interested until about five years ago. And uh, it's when I realized um, how much, you know, certain medicinal plants could help my Tourette syndrome. So um, my online name often is Tourette Grower, 
And uh, that's because I have Tourette syndrome. My 14-year-old son also has it. It's a genetic thing that runs in families. And uh, it started when I was a a young lad, probably 9 or 10, and uh, would just kind of do weird stuff with my eyes and things like that. And it wasn't until my early 20s that I was actually kind of diagnosed with it. Um, So and there's other things that come along with that, um, anxiety. Um, OCD are very popular things that go along with Tourette syndrome. So, um, yeah, when I discovered how well um, medicinal plants could help me uh, and, you know, of course, along the way, um, just other things about different plants that that we like, um, I began uh, using those those plants and um, quickly realize that uh, it's pretty expensive to source those plants from other areas and so uh, I thought well I'm just going to start um, growing my own I had a little bit of, of garden experience just being around my grandparents and stuff so um, I started uh, growing autos somebody handed me uh, a handful of auto seeds um, someone local to me and so I just began popping those and germinating them and learning and growing and researching and uh you know as i said it, it's one of the comorbids of tourette's is ocd so i can become pretty obsessive compulsive about things and i think gardening was one of them but more in a positive way you know and um yeah i just started um searching around actually and i i love podcasts including yours and uh so i was searching around for podcasts revolved more around autos and more around uh the home grower and not necessarily commercial grows and there wasn't one so uh man i just decided to start my own and uh that was back i think in 2019 or 2018 and uh that's how that came about and since then for the last five years i've just really been uh plugging away just learning and uh and gardening and um just being a part of the community that exists, you know, and just, um, jumping in there and letting that iron, iron sharpen iron, um, as they say, you know, growers coming together like you and I are right now and just talking and, uh, taking truth nuggets and learning. And, uh, it's a great community. So, um, that's pretty much it, man. Yeah. I'm in, um, located in Southern California. I was born and raised here. Um, married, I've got five kids and, uh, busy life. Yeah. Nice, nice. I'll definitely have a link to your YouTube channel down in the description section below, and also your podcast. I'll link that down in the description section below as well. We did a, we did an awesome episode on harvesting, drying, curing, and people just thought it was a good one. So I'll definitely have that episode linked down in the description section below as well. So. Yeah, and I actually, um, I'm still, yesterday, as a matter of fact, I, I got a message about that episode and uh, how much they learned and how much it helped them. So uh, now that you mentioned that, so thanks for coming on, man. I appreciate it. That's so cool to hear. So let's start with your style of gardening. I know you primarily grow autos. I think you only grow autos. You can correct me if I'm wrong there. But are you indoor grower, outdoor grower? Do you grow in soil, cocoa, hydro, organic, synthetic? What's your growth style when growing autos? Yeah, so I do primarily grow autos. Um, I do have uh, my first photo period seeds that have sprouted uh they're just a few days old so i will be going down that route and and experiencing that but uh, i also primarily grow indoors um i grow in uh grow tents i have two two foot by four foot grow tents by six foot high Um, just led lights and um one of them i've got an auto pot system set up and I know you're familiar with that. That's just an automatic gravity fed watering system that feeds the plants from the bottom up. And then in the other tent, um, I just hand water in pots. And um, I've only had two tents for um, just under a year. So I don't really have a, a, a certain you know, uh, system going with the tents or anything like that. But basically one's just hand watered and one's automatically watered um one of them i typically grow my own personal herbs in and the other one i actually um i chuck pollen i don't want to say i breed uh i chuck pollen and um and and produce seeds so one of one of them is kind of set apart for that and the other one is set apart for um my own medicine 
And then as far as soil, um, I grow in, I guess we can, we call it soil, but it's, it's really a, a, a grow medium, right? It's, uh, you know, uh, we call it soil, but it's peat, peat moss based, you know, like typical potting soil, um, with perlite and, and a little bit of compost added in. Um, I do prefer to grow organic. I went organic a couple of years ago, uh, about three years ago, and um, I kind of dabbled a little bit in the synthetics as well. Um, but I find myself really being drawn to the organics and uh, really nerding out on uh, the soil food web and microbes and things like that. So I'm really, really kind of treading down a path right now of getting deeper and deeper into um, organics. But as far as right now, um, I just grow in um, an amended potting soil, you know, with um, right now I just got dry amendments by down to earth. I just mixed them up and um, did a super, so a super soil type grow, like a sub cool, um, you know, type method. That's what I'm doing right now. Previously, I was using nature's living soil um, concentrates. Uh, those worked well for me, too. And then um, I'm also going to be testing out FOOP. Uh, sent me a little beginner line of their their entire product. Um, I don't know if you've heard of them. So uh, they're an organic bottled nutrient company, and it's called Foop F O O P, and uh, it's basically made from fish poo. And they've got a bloom and a veg and a sweetener and and things like that. So um, they just sent it to me. So I'm just going to be testing that out and um, seeing how that goes. So I, I really do, um, I'm pretty much, I'm an organic guy and, and as time goes by that passion and that style of, of growing is, is growing for me itself. I just, I keep getting more and more into it right now. I'm getting into some natural farming practices and trying to learn some different things with that. Um, just made my own lactic acid bacteria serum. I did my first, uh, indigenous microorganism collection. I just made my own, uh, water soluble calcium, uh, by roasting eggshells and soaking them in vinegar for a week, things like that, you know, save money and, uh, and, and, uh, resource my food waste and just things like that, you know, totally going, going down the organic rabbit hole for sure. That's awesome. So let's dive into autos. I think we should start with the pros and cons to autos. I know you have a whole video on this on your channel. Really good video. I actually showed it in my YouTube recommended feed. I think it, it blew up um, because YouTube has yeah, been recommending yeah. it everywhere. They still recommend it even though I've watched it. But there is a lot of pros to autos and there's a lot of cons to autos, right? Can you talk mm -hmm. to us about some of the pros and cons to growing autos? Yeah, absolutely, man. Um... I mean, some of the pros to start off, uh, they grow really fast. And I think that's something that attracts a lot of people to them. Um, from the time that they sprout from the soil, um, you know, oftentimes within 70, 75 days on average, they're, they're finished from the day they sprout. Some of them even earlier. Um, some of them will, you know, be done within 55 to 60 days, some really fast ones and still get fairly large as well. And, um, you know, some of them, t some of them will go 90 days, but for the most part, they're just super fast. You know, you pop them in the soil and once they germinate, they just take off like a freight train and, uh, and within, you know, 60 to 90 days, uh, you're harvesting your plant. Um, that's definitely, definitely one of the cons or the pros. I'm sorry. Uh, another pro is that, um, it's a day neutral plant. So, which means it doesn't require a specific light cycle to flower. So it doesn't matter if you are under 18 hours of light or 12 or even 24 with no darkness. Um, they'll flower regardlessly based off of genetics and not based off of um, a light cycle. Whereas a traditional, you know, traditional photo period plants of, of any species, uh, you know, they require a certain amount of, of light and darkness to trigger that flowering in them. So that's, that's a pro and it's a pro to a lot of people, because if you've got some room, if you've got a veg tent and let's say you've got a corner or a space or a spot, I mean, you can throw, just throw an auto in there and 
let it go. If you're, you know, growing uh, tomatoes and peppers and whatever else you're growing and there's a couple of areas and you want to throw an auto in there, like why not fill up the space? Um, so, you know, things like things like that are beneficial. Uh, they're great for concentrates as well. A lot of people are actually growing them because of the fact that they grow so fast. They're able to turn them around and press them and uh, and create uh, concentrates right from the flowers. Um, so it's a super fast turnaround. Uh, they provide a lot of oil and resin and stuff uh, that your traditional photo period plants will produce. Uh, of course, you know, depending on genetics, but um, but yeah, I mean, for the most part, you know, they're just as uh, just as powerful. Um, as long as you get good genetics, you know, and, uh, and they just grow, they just grow really fast, man. Um, another thing that's great about them is if you keep them all under the same light cycle and you've got one area with one light cycle, you can just do a constant perpetual grow of different ages. Um, you know, they, they actually will take a lot less light and that's not something I'm really familiar with. Um, I think that's something that maybe, uh, is better, uh, chatted with with dr bruce um <laughs> but as far as the dli and stuff with with autos um i'm, I'm not sure what that looks like but i, I but i do know in general i, I think they're going to require a, a little less intense light because it's on for say 18 hours instead of 12 so your dli is going to change with that for those light nerds um that's about as far as i can go with it unfortunately because i don't know much about that but uh, those are some of the pros uh, of growing autos. There are some cons. Um, there are cons to them. Absolutely. For sure. Like anything. Uh, I think the biggest one being that they automatically flower that, that could be the biggest con. And I think it's a lot of these things are subjective, right? Like depending on who the grower is and, and what they're looking for and what their style is and what their goals are. But the fact that it automatically flowers can be a problem, especially for a new grower. Um, if you encounter any deficiencies, let's say you're in, you're, uh, in a vegetative stage, let's say it's, it's been two weeks. Let's say you're like in a potting soil of some kind, uh, maybe like a Fox farm, happy frog. It's pretty popular potting soil for people to start out in. Um, that potting soil in particular is, it can tend to be more on the inert side, I guess you can say there's not a whole lot of compost or worm castings or humic acid and like all that different stuff. There's not a whole lot of it in happy frog as, as compared to ocean forest, say with the Fox farm brand. So if you sprout in something like that, within a few weeks, you're, it, the plant's going to run out of food. You're going to be showing deficiencies. If you're not, um, purposeful and proactive about uh, feeding that plant or making sure that you're set up for that next stage and you show deficiencies, you don't have a whole lot of time to correct those um, because the plant's going to end up going into flower on its own. And of course, once you see the deficiencies, um, you know, what, what's happening in the soil has already happened and you're now just seeing it in the leaves. So, um, that could be a problem, you know, if you're, if you're learning to grow and you're running it, or even if you're an experienced grower, you know, and you run into deficiencies, um, it, it's going to be an issue for you because you don't have that time to slow down and fix it and say, you know, I'm going to wait another week before I flip into flower. Or I'm going to wait another two, or I'm going to train it out a little bit more. You don't have that, that, uh, that opportunity. And I think that could be one of the biggest cons, um, one of the biggest cons to it. I think the second largest con would be that you can't clone them. And so if you find a cultivar that you're in love with or that you really liked or that uh, helped you in some way, um, you can't just clone that and keep it around. Uh, you, you Now, you can clone it. Now, let me be literal here. You can clone it. Um, and it'll root, but it's not going to do anything for you. The best that I've ever seen done, um, was a, a friend of mine in San Diego and she, um, cloned it twice. She cloned her original and then cloned that one again and just had kind of this consecutive harvest, but each clone was smaller and smaller. So as you can imagine, that's a waste of time. I mean, in my opinion, unless you're like really in love with that strain. Um, so you can't clone them. Um, another con right now, at least is, uh, there's 
there's a lot of bad genetics running around when it comes to autos in general. A lot of Facebook backyard, um, you know, Paul and Chucker, bro breeder uh, genetics. And, you know, some of them are, are okay. You know, not everybody is like that. So I don't want to, you know, speak, I don't want to paint a wide brush for everybody, but, um, my biggest caution would be to stay away from these Facebook groups, man. Um, because a lot of these Facebook groups, you got guys on there, you know, selling their, uh, you know, their, their Paul and Chuck seeds for 50 bucks for five of them, you know, and they, you know, only two of them sprout. One of them's, a female and that one is just wanky and doesn't get anywhere and it, it, you just got to be have discernment like with anything and, and just be careful but that's a con there's a lot of crazy genetics running around right now um, and I think another con and, and I kind of touched on this already but uh, is that they may not be the best to learn on you know they may not be the best uh, plant to learn on um, and for the reasons that I spoke about a bit automatically flowering because with a, a photo period um, which ironically I've never grown until now but with a photo period um, you know you have that opportunity so I think those are uh, probably the biggest bullet points as far as pros and cons go yeah I think you touched upon a lot of good ones both pros and cons you know one of the things that you mentioned is if there's any sort of stunt and growth while the plant is in the vegetation stage you could potentially impact yield right it's going to negatively impact yield if you have a, a stunt and growth it's going to automatically flower so I agree with you it might not be the best for new mm -hmm. growers to start with auto flowers right you have much more control w with photo periods so yeah I think that's that's a big one I feel like uh, because of that uh, because that uh, stunt growth and the vegetation stage could negatively impact yield a lot of people are planting autoflower seeds in the final container they're avoiding that transplant process right mm -hmm. so my question for you is what pot size do you grow autos in are you starting in a small container and then transplanting your way up to a larger container or are you just mm -hmm. starting out in a large container and avoiding that transplant process altogether i do both to be honest with you. And it's just simply because I just get itches up my butt and I like to experience uh, things and experiment. You know what I mean? I, I just, I just, I do both. For the most part, I start in the final container. Um, you can transplant autos, but you do have to be careful and you do have to do them um, at the right time to avoid that stunting. You know, you definitely, in my opinion, want to transplant them well before the stretch um, you also want to transplant them before they get too root bound in their container. So for example, if you start in a solo cup, um, typically, and I get this from my friend, Dan full duplex, um, typically when those leaves hit the outer edge of that solo cup, your, your, the roots of that auto is, is most likely hit the bottom and just starting to kind of circle around down there. For some odd reason, and this is totally anecdotal with just me and a few people, um, we just all kind of agree that for some reason, if, if they're, when they're started in a really small pot, if you don't transplant them quick enough, they will become root bound and they'll, it, for some, it seems to trigger them into flower a little bit earlier almost. Like anything less than one gallon. Now, I'm not claiming that scientifically. I'm not claiming that as bro science either. I'm just kind of, some of us have been like, hmm, that's, that's interesting, you know? So you want to, um, you want to get it out of that, that solo cup. If that's what you're starting in, once the leaves kind of hit that outer edge, I use that rule of thumb for any size container I start in. Um, sometimes I'll start like in a half gallon pot. Um, that's what I did recently. I started in half gallon pots. I was kind of doing a miniature pheno hunt. So I started in small pots. Once the leaves hit the edges, um, the plants had showed sex. And so, um, I went ahead and just transplanted the ones that I wanted to keep and move those ones forward. If you don't transplant them in time, they're just going to end up getting root bound and they're going to end up going into flower. And then if you transplant them, you're just going to really stunt them even more. So transplanting is possible and, and it's, and it's, it's, it's very doable. It's just, you really got to pay attention and, and kind of do it at the right time. You know, because that it just it's going to keep going and it's on a time schedule. You know, the clock is just ticking and ticking and ticking and ticking. So you don't you don't want to mess that up, you know. 
some people are going to claim that transplanting is is beneficial because then they have the opportunity to sprinkle some mycorrhizal fungi onto the roots right mm -hmm. it's going to attach to the root system be an extension of the root system help with nutrient uptake so transplanting process they'll be, they're able to sprinkle directly onto the roots i personally mm -hmm. like to do like a third cup of worm castings put that in the bottom of the hole that's going to definitely help with uh, beneficial mm -hmm. microbes you, you know and it's close to the root zone so i've had mm -hmm. good luck doing that it's a good idea. What size container? Are you in five gallons? Are you in seven mm -hmm. gallons or, or what? All over the place, man. So in my auto pots, they're 3.9 gallons, but I'm considering upgrading to the 6.6 .6 gallons. I think they are. Um, and the reason being is, is because they end up running out of, uh, out of food and top dressing is, is challenging and stuff with those because they're bottom fed. So typically three, three point nine gallons for the auto pots. In my other tent, um, if I'm if I'm doing like any type of pollen chucking or anything like that, I usually grow in small pots so that I can um, sprout a bunch of them and, and kind of weed out the ones I don't want. Um, and, and if not, uh, then I actually like to put two 10-gallon pots in a 2x4 tent and just grow two. Just two of them in that 2x4 tent um, is, is great too because in a 10-gallon pot – um, you know, I can mix up a super soil and it'll have plenty in there, uh, to get that thing through those whole life with a true, a more true water only. And, uh, and it'll, you know, they'll fill up a two by four tent easily two two plants in a 10 gallon pot. So I'm kind of all over the place, man, to be honest with you. Okay. Yeah. You've tried a whole bunch of things there. Yeah. I just, I'm always just doing different stuff, you know, but, um, uh, but as far as like pot size, what I would suggest, I mean, in my opinion, it's uh, a lot of this stuff is just kind of subjective as to, again, what you're doing, what your goals are, what your grow area looks like. Um, if you're in a really small area and you've got a, a ceiling max height, then you might consider smaller pots, you know, um, just things like that. Yeah, for sure. I want to back up and go back to your starting mix. You touched mm -hmm. base on it a little bit. You had mentioned that you're mostly in peat, mixture with perlite, and you're using down to earth nutrients. Can you be a little bit more specific on like, you know, how, what's your ratio of peat to aeration and what specific amendments you're mixing in to begin with? Yeah. So I'm actually, um, right now I'm actually using bagged potting soil. This last run, I actually used ocean forest cause I had three or four bags laying around. I plan on getting away from that, um, just to save some money. But, uh, from what I understand, that's a typical, you know, uh, three, three, three of, um, you know, like peat moss compost and then an aeration like perlite. I would like to get away from perlite cause when I hand water, it all just kind of tends to float to the top. Um, I'm thinking of going with rice holes, uh, because of their, <clears throat> their, uh, aeration quality as well as, you know, that they break down and provide silica to your plant. But there's been some talk about something, um, I don't know, man, like something, I forget what it is, but there's been some talk about how they can produce some type of negative chemical or something, if I'm not mistaken, but I don't know. So the, the potting soil, it's already bagged up. And then what I did this round, now what I usually do is I've been using nature's living soil. And so that's just a, a concentrate that they provide to you, which is basically like a bunch of dry amendments already uh, kind of cooked up, you know, by the microbial life and it's readily available. It also has microbes in it. That's typically what I would use before. Um, and I would just add that to a happy frog or an ocean forest um, or pro mix or any of those, those potting soils, you add that to like the bottom third or mix it thoroughly. And it's supposed to be like a pretty much a water only all the way through. Um, what I'm doing now is I've switched gears and I bought all of the, um, dry amendments, uh, to make my own super soil from down to earth. And, uh, this is my first time doing it. Um, so I can't really speak as to how it's working or anything like that. Um, I've just got some seedlings that just sprouted up that are in their final pots in that mix. But what I did, uh, was I just mixed that in to the bottom half and then the top half, I just did ocean forest. So the idea is, and some people say ocean forest is too hot for autos. Um, I have never had one auto have an issue. So, um, 
I mean, to each their own, uh, that, but that's just been my experience. So, um, I start seedlings in that stuff with no issues. So on the top half of my pot, I have got Fox farm ocean forest and I did add perlite. Um, I like to add, you know, quite a bit. I like to have really, really, really well draining aerated soil. And so, um, the bottom half is, uh, ocean forest with the, uh, dry amendments mixed up inside of them. And so basically, you know, my seed will just pop up and it will grow in that ocean forest. And when it's when the plant is mature enough and uh, it's a little, a little more established, it'll hit that super soil and uh, it'll begin to use that, um, to uptake those nutrients that the microbes have been breaking down for the last couple of weeks. Um, so that's kind of where I'm at right now. Um, I'm not sure if I'm just going to keep going down that route. Um, I'm considering uh, getting into purchasing like a two foot by four foot bed and getting some peat moss and some rice holes and some of my own compost and make start starting my own living soil uh, indoors. But that's I've got a lot to learn when it comes to that. And uh, I don't want to just pull the trigger on that without doing my my research first, you know, because I don't want to waste my time. It's a, it's an investment, <laughs> you know, if yeah. you mess things up, then uh, you mess things up and, and your overall result might not be what you anticipated, unfortunately. Yeah. So let's dive a little bit deeper into nutrients, right? So we talked about your starting mix when you're not doing the super soil method that you talked about, right? You're just using bag mm -hmm. soil. Eventually the nutrients are going to deplete in the medium, right? So this is going to highly depend on the pot size, right? If you're in a larger pot size, with more soil, more nutrients in there. It's going to take longer for that plant to work through it versus a smaller pot size. Let's say a three gallon grow pot, for example. So say you're in a smaller grow pot and you need to feed the plant. You know, you need to feed the plant the nutrients. Uh, I know you said you're, you're organic. What nutrients, I think you mentioned down to earth. What mm -hmm. nutrients are you using and when are you feeding? Okay. So typically I did mix. Um, so prior to my dry amendment grow that I'm doing now. Like I said, I'd mix nature's living soil. So, and that would have enough nutrients to get me through usually until, you know, mid flower. Um, and then mid flower is, is when I would, um, start to see deficiencies or run into issues. And, um, so with, with autos, a lot of times you can get through your veg without adding any veg nutrients if you really don't want to. Um, depending on what type of soil you're in. A lot of people like will grow an ocean forest, for example, and then when their auto flower goes into bloom, um, they will then just begin adding their bloom nutrients or top dressing, you know, bloom uh, type dry amendments and stuff like that. So, but what I would do is um, I would let the plant grow. And then uh, what I like to do now is right when it starts to go into flower, and um, what I mean by that is, you know, when when the flowering spots are starting to, you know, really spit out some of those um, white pistols and stuff. At that point, I like to top dress um, and begin feeding teas. So what I'll do is when it starts to go into flower, um, nature's living soil makes this product called girl flower power and it's made for bloom. And, and it's, of course, it's something that we can make on our own. Um, but you just sprinkle that on top and maybe etch it in a little bit and water over it and, uh, let that, you know, kind of get in there and that'll begin to break down and feed the plants. And then I also like to brew teas, um, whether that's just an earthworm castings tea to add microbial life itself and some nutrients um, or nutrient teas, right? Where your, your plant is actually being fed an organic tea where it, it can uptake certain things right away. Um, it's a, a benefit of the girl flower power is that um, it contains microbes and, and, and diverse microbial life, but it also has um, readily available nutrients for your plants because it's already basically those dry amendments have already been cooked, so to speak, have already been broken down and, and readily available forms for the plant. Um, so between the top dressing and a tea, um, 
you know, the top dressing, I like to sprinkle a little bit on and kind of water it in and then let it, let it go for maybe another week and then sprinkle a little more and just little bits at a time and then just feed teas and let the tea go to work. And, uh, that'll usually get me through, um, you know, till the end. So it's not a lot, not a lot, really, not a lot of feeding going on. Um, and these days I'm really trying to focus more on feeding the soil rather than feeding the plant, um, with my own kind of grow technique and what I'm into. So, and you know, it's, it's, I, I tend to focus more on the quality, the end quality and the, of course, everybody wants volume, um, you know, I, I prefer my, 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 my red delicious apples to be huge. If I, if, if I can, you know, I want to enjoy it, you know, but I, I, I'm more concerned about the quality of that apple as well, or the quality of, of the herbs as well. And I try not to just push for size, um, and looks and things like that. I try to really dial it in because I'm using this stuff as medicine, you know, um, more so than, than recreational, um, so I try to, um, you know, just focus on the end quality and as far as, um, you know, terpenes and, and different things like that, um, that are going to help me medically. So, I hear uh, growing organic works great for that. Cause I'm not trying to grow monster plants or trying to push anything too hard. I, it's just not my, uh, just not my thing. Yeah. I totally get what you mean. Let's, uh, let's switch it up. Let's talk about environment for autos, right? So what temperature and humidity do you typically aim for when growing autos? The same as photos, typically. I mean, really anywhere, if I can keep it anywhere, really, if I can keep it around 50 through the whole grow, that would be great. I do try to tailor it a little more earlier in its life. I, I try to get the humidity up. Right now, I've got some seedlings, and I've got the humidity up to about 70%. Um, when they begin to grow and get a little bit bigger, um, I'll drop that down personally. I try, I try to mess with the humidity. It's difficult for me because I live in a pretty arid, dry environment. So the humidity can change very fast as far as declining for me. Um, so I, I, I'm constantly battling to keep it up, <clears throat> to keep it up. So if I can just keep it at around 50 basically through the whole grow and maybe drop it a little bit during flower, which is really easy for me. Um, then I'm happy. Yeah, that's, but you know, to be honest, man, um, I've grown them, uh, outdoors during like right now, during the winter, it's January. I've had plants out there, um, a couple of years ago right now in Southern California and you know, it'll be 60 during the day and drop down to 32, 30 to 29 sometimes at night. And, uh, if I don't have too many of those nights of that freezing temperatures, I've grown some, some pretty good looking large plants outdoors in the winter, in the cold. Um, it's not too humid here, so I, I don't have to worry about any type of rot or anything like that. And, uh, it's, you know, it's, and it's sunny, it's sunny Southern California. So, but you know, I do try to to dial it in, man, as much as I can, you know, in my indoor environment, of course, to, to just get that extra little umph, you know, a lot of people don't know that these plants are resilient, right? There's an optimal range for conditions, right? And then there's a tolerance range. So there is a large range that these plants were able to survive in, right? So cold nights are common outdoors and the plant still survives, you know, it's within their tolerance range. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think that tolerance range is, is wider than a, a lot of people think it is. Yeah. And temperatures, you know, pretty much the same as photos. Um, I do like to run warm if I can. Uh, I prefer to hit like 80, maybe even up to 82. Some people think that's a little warm. Um, but in my environment, I notice that that kind of tends to have the best, uh, fastest growth for me. Um, and when you're using led lights, I think there's might there may be some science to that of, of being able to run things warmer or something. I'm not sure, but, um, yeah, you know, environment, um, the more that I can dial in my environment, uh, the better my plants and more healthier my plants are going to be and going to grow. So I do try to dial it in, but you're right, man. I mean, these, you know, plants, they want to live, you know, they just want to live. Um, I've got a mandarin orange tree that, uh, I was gone for eight months, uh, caring for my grandma. And when I came home, um, it was almost dead. I had only been coming home like on the weekends sometimes. And, uh, 
I ended up just chopping that thing about four inches from the soil. And I'll be darned, man, I came out there in the spring and that thing had little green leaves on it. And now that thing is about six and a half feet tall. And it just, those little sucker leaves grew and I braided them and it was really cool, man. But these plants, want, they want to live. They're like you and I, they want to live. Every, everything that's alive has a, a will to survive. You know, even microbial life, everything wants to live. And, uh, so it, it's, it's, um, they'll do well, man. You know, they'll do well in, in environments. I've, I've grown them like in the, in the rain and just all, it's not ideal, but, um, I've done it, you know? Yeah. There are a lot of people that are okay with the, you know, just being in the tolerance range, but there are some people that want to really dial things in and, and be in the optimal ranges. Let's talk about CO2. CO2 is something that's often supplemented when growing indoors. Do you supplement CO2 at all? I don't. Um, and I'm, I don't because I just, I'm not educated on it and I'm not sure as far as like, you know, a, an exhale bag or a T and B naturals. Um, no, I don't. Um, I'm not educated on that really as far as, um, how that works and, and being able to add more light and, and things like that. Um, I'm not convinced necessarily that, that those products really do anything. Um, I don't understand it. Uh, if someone can explain it to me, I'd, uh, I'd be great. But, um, yeah, I, don't, I just, I, I don't supplement, uh, CO2 just cause I'm not, I'm not convinced that it, that it works. You can cut that out if you've got like any type of deals with anybody, dude, <laughs> like TMV natural or somebody. Yeah. I just, uh, I'm just not, I just don't, uh, I don't supplement CO2. I've used the TMB Naturals canisters. I used for quite some time and I actually did put a CO2 monitor in the room and it actually does work. There was often times where it averaged on around 800, 900 PPM. And of course, it's going to depend on how much you exhaust. I was exhausting intermittently. Yeah. I also now I started using the mushroom bags. And so I use the exhale bag, the mushroom bag. I have it hanging above the plants, the top part of my grow tent. And within a couple of weeks, that whole substrate was really inoculated i mean the whole thing's like white at this point and uh, i don't have my co2 monitor in there i have one of the holder ones we have to actually hook it up to the wall and it's like mm. this big basically the size of softball for those that are that are listening in on, on one of the podcast platforms there really needs to be more companies releasing co2 monitors i mean i'm, I'm about to mm. talk to ac infinity and be like dude if you guys release a co2 monitor it'll fly off the shelves because nobody has yeah. co2 monitors right now that are affordable, right? I mean, I know Pulse mm -hmm. has one, but I think theirs is connected to like a, it's like a $500 device because it also has like PAR and it has temperature, humidity, all that stuff. Worth the money, you know, because you, you can actually measure PAR. So for a lot of people, they say it's worth the money, but you know, I'd really love to see a standalone CO2 monitor that hooks up to your app so you can see the different levels throughout the day along with temperature and humidity. I mean, Soon, I mean, if you're a company listening, build, uh, you know, make it right now because that'll, that'll for sure fly off the shelves. I'm confident of that one. <laughs> yeah, I think that would help everybody out, you know, and um, I by no means am saying that they don't work. I, I just personally was, was, haven't been convinced, but I mean, you've got a CO2 monitor and you're, you're monitoring it and it's up, but um, you know, I've got some, some friends who have done the same thing and it, and it shoots up to eight or 900, but, but within 24 to 48 hours, it's, it's back down low and it doesn't hike back up. Um, even when they're shaking the, the bottles or, and stuff like that. So, um, I just personally just haven't pulled the trigger on it, but you're right, man, a, a, a monitor would be great, you know, an, a, an affordable one. So people like me can be like, well, let's try this out for myself, you know? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah. How about plant training? Let's get into that a little bit. It's a highly debated topic, right? When we mm -hmm. talk about some of the types of training. So low stress training, I think a lot of people do with autos in particular. Definitely helps with kind of having those even colas. You prevent that, you know, the plant growing Christmas tree style and have one big main cold that's at risk for, for bud rot and mold to get in, in the middle of it due to lack of airflow, so on and so forth. So low stress training is very, very common. Topping is one of those things that are very, very de debated, right? We touched upon how... You know, any stunt growth is going to negatively impact yield, but there's some people that swear by topping and, you know, doing one top at a certain point and they swear that they get a bigger yield off of it. Hmm. What's your stance, you know, on, on training? We can even get into super cropping. Do you do any low stress training, super cropping, topping, any type of plant training when you're growing autos? So I've never super cropped, um, but I used to top every single auto I grew. 
And, um, you know, my stance really is whatever works for you. That's my stance. That's usually my stance on a lot of this stuff. Um, I think that topping has a place for me. Again, this stuff is subjective for me. Topping is, is good when it's needed as far as, um, ceiling height maxes and stuff like that. I started out in a two by two by four tent, a four foot ceiling height, in my opinion, unless you're growing like microgreens is really low. And so, um, the plants would grow up into dangerous areas in that light very easily. Um, when you, you know, if you've got a pot down at the bottom, that's taken up a foot and then the soil level starts and then you've got to stay, let's say you're, you're, you know, you, let's say your light in particular, you need to stay at least 18 inches away. Um, you know, that only leaves you so much space. So that's why I topped. Now you can indeed top autos. Uh, you can top them at whatever node you want. The question is, is, is it going to be beneficial for you? And, um, so let's break this down into a couple of different categories here. As far as yield, I myself have never had increased yield from topping an auto. Now I can't say that with absolute certainty, because like we talked about earlier, I'm, un I'm unable to clone an auto and do a side-by-side -side comparison. You know, if we could clone one and then have two identical plants, top one, not top the other, grow them the same and see what happens, that would be great. But we don't have the benefit of doing that with autos because you can't clone them correctly. So, uh, in my opinion, and based off of my experience, I don't see them giving you any, giving me any more yield. Uh, that could be grower error. That could be my own, uh, grow techniques. That could be something I did. I'm not pumping full of, uh, of, of synthetic nutrients. I mean, if you're in DWC, um, there's so many variables that could play into this, you know, but in general, yes, you can top. Um, if you're topping to get more yield, uh, that didn't work for me. It doesn't work for a lot of people. If some people say that it does work for them, then maybe, um, maybe that method of those people that it's working for is kind of where people need to flock to and, and build upon. Um, for me in my method, it doesn't really produce any more yields for me. So I think there are other reasons to do it. Uh, so like for me, ceiling height, another reason to do it. There's a, a guy on Instagram named green 75. He tops and hacks and bends and ties and trains these things. Like they're just yarn, you know what I mean? And, um, he does it because he wants to shoot for all colas and not necessarily popcorn fluff and stuff all along the bottom. Um, so I'm not sure it gives you more yield. Um, for me, it didn't. And for a lot of people I know it doesn't, I prefer to just grow them naturally and do some low stress training. I think low stress training is great. Um, it doesn't really stress the plan out. Um, and the biggest yields that I've gotten, if I had to compare and I had to make a guess was from low stress training, um, a topped plant, uh, an, an untopped plant, and then a low stress trained plant. The LST one, uh, has, I I've gotten the biggest results out of, and that was actually just simply kind of bending the plant over almost and, and letting it grow, uh, horizontal and letting the side branches grow up. And I just ended up with these huge, like just spear colas shooting out all over the place. Um, but a lot of times these days I just let them grow. And, uh, it's just because I'm fascinated with their natural state. I do like to, you know, shave the legs, so to speak, and lollipop a little bit and get some of that larf on the bottom. But, um, but for the most part, I just like to let them grow, but it's a debated topic, man. It is. Um, can you top? Absolutely. Of course you can. Should you? Uh, well, that's like I said, that depends solely upon your, your, your experience, your goals, uh, your environment, um, all those different things. Uh, that's just my subjective opinion on it though. <laughs> How about defoliation? Some people like to strip their plants basically naked to where they have just a few leaves on each branch. Are you doing any mm -hmm. type of defoliation techniques on autos? Not unless they're really leafy and bushy. Not unless a leaf is really in the way. I do a lot of tucking 
I like to tuck the leaves and get them out of the way. Um, if it's a really, really leafy plant and it just looks really wild and nuts, then yeah, I'll, I'll defoliate it a little bit. Um, I try not to do too much at one time, but I like to just kind of give the plant, um, what it needs to the best of my ability to get the best genetic expression out of that plant as I can. That's kind of my goal. Gotcha. There's a few more things that I want to get your input on. So a few questions. Do you flush before harvest or give your plants a period of darkness before harvest? And then along with that, when do you harvest? Okay. If I'm growing in synth with synthetic nutrients, then, then I do flush. Um, and, but I don't really grow synthetically anymore. So no, I, I don't flush, um, growing an organic. Sometimes the plant will naturally fade. Sometimes it won't. Um, as far as when I harvest, I mostly pay attention to trichome development as well as, um, I look for the pistols, um, kind of like we talked about on, on my podcast. I look for the pistols to recede, kind of curl up and kind of want to go into the plant, turn orange or brown or whatever color they turn. Um, of course, I like to see the flowers themselves uh, kind of fatten up a little bit. And uh, I pay attention to trichome development. It's a really weird thing with autos in, in my experience. Um, and I hear other people say this as well, man. It's really weird. Uh, they don't go to amber trichomes a whole lot. Um, if you're waiting to get like a 50, 50, you know, like you do, like some people want to go crazy, like 50, 50 Amber cloudy on a, on a photo period, like uh, autos, a lot of times they won't do that. And you'll just be waiting around and that thing's done and ready to be harvest. Um, so I typically just wait until I see, um, growth slow. Uh, sometimes they'll, I think you said like, sometimes they'll even stop kind of uptaking a lot of water as much as usual. Um, I wait for those pistols and I just wait for the trichomes to be mostly cloudy and, uh, and, and nice and, you know, milky and cloudy. And, uh, and I wait for some amber, usually I'll get five to 10%. And at that point I tend to harvest. Um, that's pretty much my preferred area of harvest, probably even with a photo as well. So. Gotcha. That makes sense. Well, this could have easily been a two or a three hour podcast episode. <laughs> There's a lot of things that we didn't cover. Maybe in a future episode. Who knows? Yeah. Might be a part two. Who knows? Yeah, anytime. <laughs> but definitely appreciate you you coming on. Tell us, how can the listeners find you and, and what do you have upcoming in the future? Yeah, so you can find me. Uh, my hub basically is Instagram. That's kind of where I hang out. Uh, you can find me there at Tourette Grower. Um, also autoflower podcast, those two accounts, uh, same two usernames on YouTube. Um, you can find me there as well. Um, and this year I'm just diving more into, uh, organics, uh, more into natural farming techniques. I'm going to be documenting, uh, how to produce your own seeds at home. Um, just to have your own plants to grow, not, not teaching how to breed or anything like that. I'm um, going to be uh, just trying to share and document how to grow for uh, inexpensive, um, real cheap, and use resources from around home. And, uh, and that's pretty much it, man. I'm just uh, looking forward to continuing to uh, be a part of this community, man. And uh, I appreciate you having me on, brother. Really appreciate it. Yeah, no problem. I'll definitely link Chad's channel down in the description section below if you're tuned in on YouTube. Also link that episode we did together on your podcast. That'll be linked down in the description section below. I would like to actually make that your most viewed episode. So if the viewers here could do me a favor and click on that episode, give it a listen, go ahead and comment, let them know uh, that I sent you over there. And let's see if we can get it the most viewed episode on your your channel there so sweet if you enjoyed this podcast click that thumbs up button if you're tuned in on one of the podcast platforms like apple podcasts please leave a rating and review and if you are on youtube subscribe every single weekend i'm releasing a new podcast episode with a new guest so thanks chad appreciate you coming on and i hope you enjoy the rest of your day yeah you too